The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Chris Judson with Remy. Today, we will discuss modeling the economic impacts of decarbonization strategies on the U.S. economy by 2050. The research was led by MIT and modeled by FTI Consulting in its Economic Impacts Group. It is a pleasure to host Scott Nystrom, Senior Director at FTI Consulting. Scott Nystrom is an expert in macroeconomic regional and energy system modeling and applying them to policy analysis and economic impacts and other types of modeling and economic analysis. As the co-lead of the firm's North American Economic Impacts Group, he uses models such as REMI, IMPLAN, and GTAP daily to model the impacts of legislation, litigation regulation, and policy on the economy as measured by metrics like job growth, GDP, and tax collection. His work on economic impact uh, analysis has covered vast uh, industry sectors of the economy, including agriculture, natural resources, construction, utilities, manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, and services. Mr. Nystrom's experience leads him to regularly present to federal and state policymakers. Highlights include presenting his findings to members of Congress, on the economic contribution of electric cooperatives, Capitol Hill briefings on federal climate policy, the impacts of tax incentives and economic development grants to budget committees. Uh, these include the legislatures of Arkansas, Massachusetts, North Carolina, North Dakota, Rhode Island, Vermont, and others. Prior to FTI consulting, Mr. Nystrom worked at Regional Economic Models, or REMI. While at REMI, he was the lead of consulting engagements client training and support in the Washington, D.C. office. He has extensive experience with impact models as well as energy system models such as CTAM and the Power System Optimizer or PSO uh, and using them in concert would parallel with one another. Um, a few matters of housekeeping today, folks. Uh, please submit any questions you have uh, through the questions window. We will answer those questions uh, at the conclusion of this presentation. Um, it has you know, truly been a pleasure to, to work with Scott uh, over these years. And with that being said, uh, Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Remy hasn't given me the privileges to share my screen quite yet, so I will just get going and provide some introduction and context um, without slides for a moment before we get into that. As Chris, Chris mentioned, um, oh, here we go, thank you. Okay, and then view, full screen. Here we go. Okay, so for context for everybody, what this study was um, is an attempt to design a technological pathway for the U.S. economy and U.S. energy sector to completely reduce its net carbon dioxide emissions to zero by the year 2050. So standard disclaimer that this isn't the views of, M of either MIT or FTI. This is the results of a single analysis. Um, so I'll just leave this screen up. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not here to pitch anybody with anything. I'm here to talk about the modeling. But FTI is a large professional services firm, uh, does lots of different types of economics and research. Um, for this particular engagement, we work with an MIT who provided kind of the individual subject area expertise about how you would decarbonize. So experts in uh, residential heating, experts in the vehicular sector, ex experts in the power sector and the like. And we went through and modeled what that would actually look like in aggregate across the whole energy sector. And in particular, what that would mean for the US economy using the Remy model. So I'll keep going real quick and get a little more into the actual way we're gonna end up doing this. So real quick, walking through each of these um, areas. Here's the technological pathway that we designed with MIT um, to come up with the results that we um, eventually will show you as we go along through this. So the first thing is there's a couple of federal policies that we implemented, one of which is a $40 per metric ton of CO2 carbon tax starting in 2025 and then escalating in real terms, so adjusting the inflation out at 8% per year. 
We take the money that comes in from that carbon tax and recycle it through administrative programs. So we assume just a 1% uh, collection for administration or dis disbursement for administration. Um, we invested some of the money in infrastructure. We invested some of that in worker retraining and relocation for the economic upsets that something like this might cause. And then whatever leftover balance we did not have um, goes to households as a straight dividend. You could imagine that as just a direct payment, a check. Um, you could also imagine that as something like a tax credit, refundable or not. Um, we also included what's called a border adjustment for heavy manufacturing. That's a complex topic that you could probably do an entire webinar on by itself, and maybe I'll do that someday. But that is a policy that's designed to implement a carbon tax at the border based on the carbon content of the energy coming in. Um, so this would be mostly for bulk commodities like steel and chemicals, aluminum, agricultural products and the like that would otherwise perhaps have their production shift overseas. It would leak both the production and the emissions to other countries in response to um, a domestic U.S. carbon price. Um, Europe already has some measures that are very similar to this for its domestic carbon pricing, domestic in the European Union sense. Um, so this would be designed to put an equal fee, put an equal price of carbon on those imports. So there's no competitive advantage gained overseas by moving production out of the United States to other places. There's also aggressive state, federal, RPS, and CES policies. RPS is renewable portfolio standard. CES is clean energy standard. That's something that's in the power sector that mandates either a certain amount of wind and solar be generated or other related renewables. So batteries can be in there, geothermal can be in there, nuclear can be in there. Every state does it a little bit differently. Um, or a certain percent of power generation has to hit some qualification as green or clean. Um, so we'd be inducing a lot of uh, decarbonization in the power sector, and I'll talk about that in particular. On the energy demand side, so one is we're encouraging, um, you know, all these transitions with this federal policy things, but to get kind of more into what the technical side would be happening for energy demand, we would have a 25% reduction in energy service demand. So just the, the demand overall, how much fuel is burned, how much electricity is consumed, et cetera, et cetera, by 2050 relative to the forecast in the AEO reference case. So very, very aggressive energy efficiency um, is also part of this. Energy supply, we would convert 5% of residential and commercial heating load per year from gas or petroleum to electricity between 2031 and 50. The idea there being is at the current moment, most U.S. homes and most commercial structures use either natural gas or petroleum products, um, usually something like propane or fuel oil, for their own internal heating. Um, we are going to convert that all to electricity by 2050, starting in 2031. The fact that it's 5% a year, so it would take 25 years or 20 years to do it, is intentional. Um, the idea being is the equipment that actually generates heat um, inside of these homes and these buildings lasts about 20 years. So you're letting it naturally depreciate. You're not replacing any you know, gas-fired furnaces that are still in a good working order. You're just replacing the new ones. Um, so if there's any sort of turnover in the stock, you're replacing them with electrified equipment. Um, same pattern for elect industrial heating, though we're only doing 2% a year, so we only end up converting 40%. There's some technical challenges in the industrial field, and this is something that we talked about with MIT quite extensively. Certain industrial processes are not very amenable to electrification, given the current uh, capabilities of electrified heat as opposed to thermal heat from burning gas or petroleum. Um, Certain industrial processes need really, really high temperatures, and evidently electric heat pumps would basically melt themselves to get to those high of temperatures. So there's a certain amount of industrial heating that just is resistant to electrification as a consequence. So we left some of that in there, which means there's still going to be some emissions for the economy at that point, which we're going to have to address, we're going to have to deal with um, through other means. And we'll talk about how we did that in a second. Um, for light duty vehicles, so this would be basically, you know, like a F-250 on down roughly, 80% um, of new sales, we'd ramp up to it, but by 2030, 80% of new light duty vehicle sales would be electric. 
and 100% by 2020, 35. So there'd be a little hold out there. The idea there is pretty similar to what I just talked about in the heating sector. Um, vehicles last 15, 20 years, roughly. There's certainly exceptions of vehicles that last longer than that. Um, and there's certainly ones that don't last that long, but the kind of modal area for how long a car on the road is going to last is 15 to 20 years. So this would say by 2050 that pretty much all the light duty vehicle fleet, not 100%, there's still going to be, you know, occasional um, internal combustion vehicles out there. But for the most part at that point, the electric vehicle or light duty vehicle fleet has been electrified. The last one here under energy supply is heavy duty vehicles. So this would be kind of trucks that aren't light trucks, so everything bigger than a pickup. Um, the biggest component of this is heavy duty, uh, long haul semi trucks, you know, 18 wheelers. Um, so this one, we converted only 60% of new sales um, by 2030, but we didn't increase it from there. So that implies there's still 40% that would be using likely a petroleum product. This is another kind of, you know, limits of the technology as far as we understand it. There's a lot of trucks that stay within, or a lot of heavy duty vehicles that stay within kind of a constrained geography. So this would be like mail trucks, delivery trucks, um, have like construction equipment, buses, those kind of things, uh, sanitation vehicles, where they're gonna kind of tool around the same route in the same city or the same metro area day after day after day after day, which means they are relatively amenable to electrification because you can charge them overnight when they're not being used and then use them again the next day and then go out and do it again over and over again, um, which wouldn't really interrupt what we understand about the workflow with those vehicles. The problem is the long haul stuff that actually goes from metro area to metro area. So the again, the 18 wheelers that go from the port of L.A. Long Beach throughout the rest of the country. Um, the MIT folks, again, furthest thing from an engineer here, but explaining this in high level concepts, basically explain that there's no way to make a battery that would have enough energy in it where you wouldn't use up all your energy just carting the battery around as opposed to car uh, carting an actual payload around. Um, the energy density for mass of batteries is just too low for long haul trucking. So you'd still need to use some sort of internal combustion to do that. That can be something else. It could be like a CNG or an LNG truck, for instance, but it needs to be something different than um, electrification for that truly long haul stuff. So we're still gonna have some emissions at the end of this, um, again, by 2050, a little bit from the power sector, um, more significant amounts from the industrial and transportation sector, which we'll have to address somehow else, which we'll get to in a minute. And then the power sector, we modeled that wind and solar would be much, much cheaper, 80% decrease in their prices by 2050 for capacity and a 50% decrease in 2050 for battery storage, nuclear and carbon capture. Um, so we do allow a few kind of newish emerging technologies inside the power sector in the modeling we're doing. One of them is the construction of new or retrofitting coal and natural gas plants with carbon capture and storage. And then also small new modular nuclear reactors, some next generation nuclear reactors that are, again, small, think like a shipping container um, and can be plugged in and out of systems. They could be used in microgrids and like remote parts of Alaska or something like that, um, or they could be plugged into the main grid. Um, and then we also made it so you could build a lot more wind and solar. Um, so we, we put a couple that compared to what's allowable now. Um, at the moment, the amount of wind and solar that's being built is constrained by something called an interconnection queue. An interconnection queue is a uh, limit that the utility planners put on how much wind and solar can be added to the system and still be dealt with through the transmission system. Um, so we relaxed those limits um, and then allowed those, again, new technologies that we talked about a second ago. So big changes. The overall theme here, I think probably some people picked up on, um, is electrification. That the path out of this that's being conceived of here is heavily leaning into electrifying residential and commercial energy use, electrifying light duty and what available heavy duty vehicles you have and what industrial demand you have. So you're gonna very, very much increase the amount of electricity that needs to be generated while reducing the amount of natural gas and petroleum that's being burned directly by residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation customers. I'll also note too, I'm watching this with great interest, um, but 
and I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's going on with it, but there's been some news lately about uh, fusion that actually generates a net increase in energy being per perhaps possible. And if it is, that absolutely would be wonderful. But I don't think anybody would say that we're on the cusp of large scale commercial fusion power being deployed across the world. Um, even if the concept has been proven, there's still probably a lot of work that needs to be done to work out the technical kinks and make it so you can harvest the energy and turn a turbine to generate electricity with it. Um, so even if all those things are coming, like within maybe our lifetimes, they're still probably at least a decade or decades out, which means the pathway in the power sector that we're looking at here is still going to have to be followed more or less to the 2050s. And you still have kind of these demand side issues of electrification is great, but it doesn't handle absolutely everything. So there's still some discussion about what we need to do about the transportation and industrial sectors and their partial resistance to electrification in terms of decarbonization. Okay, so when that's do a little chart and graph fun now. Um, I've been talking at you guys for a while and I want to make sure everybody can, uh, you know, visualize what I've been discussing. So here's a visualization of it. On the left is the AEL. This is the Department of Energy's forecast. Um, it's available online for free. Anybody can look at it. I just made some charts and graphs off the top of it of what they think is kind of the BAU or the reference or the baseline or the do nothing, whatever you want to kind of call that neutral comparison we're going to make on the left. And what they show is that energy demand in the next 30 years is going to be relatively flat, kind of saddles a little bit about 2030, 2035, and then increase in the long term. The unit here, by the way, um, are quads or quadrillion BTUs. So the U.S. economy in a given year uses about 100 quadrillion BTUs. Um, the MIT pathway on the right, as you can see, is it starts in the same place, about 100, but then it starts to not nosedive, but it decreases pretty significantly. And so this is a combination of the things that I mentioned a second ago. It's the energy efficiency, and then it's also um, electricity has less heat loss than does um, most fossil fuels. So just to give an example of that, when you run a car, just a normal gasoline car, you're gonna lose like 80% of the energy that the, the fuel could theoretically generate to heat loss, but just radiating out from the engine block kind of uselessly. And then you're gonna capture about 20% of that power mechanically to the wheels through the drivetrain. An electric vehicle does have some energy loss in its deployment, batteries are not perfectly efficient. But an electric vehicle is like 80, 90% efficient, while a fossil vehicle is like 20-ish percent efficient. So electrifying things means that you can have um, less energy to do the same works in some cases. Um, so that's part of the reason this is decreasing. So we're gonna have to generate less energy by 2050 under this scenario, instead of having about 110 quads, now we're down to about 70 quads. So it's like a 30, 35% decrease, pretty significant there. But what's really interesting about it to me is the composition of what that looks like. So on the left, we can see what fuels are going into this energy mixture. In the AEO forecast, again, there's not a lot of dynamicism there. It's kind of just moving sideways. It little bit, but not much. Uh, the dark blue at the bottom is petroleum. The medium blue above that is gas. Everything else, which is like biomass, which is mostly wood and stuff, is above that. Coal's in there too. Um, and then on top of that, the silver color is electricity. Um, and that's electricity from any source. That could be gas and coal plants. That could be nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, whatever it is. If it's electricity, if it's electrons, um, you know, spinning around, making lights go. Again, not a scientist here. Um, it's in the gray category, the silver category on top. So in AEO, electricity demand right now is 36.8 quads. Don't worry so much about remembering the numbers, just remembering the magnitudes here is really what's important, which is going to grow to about 41.6 in 2050. So there is growth in electricity demand in that scenario, but it's a pretty modest amount. Well, if you look at the MIT pathway, now we're up to 47. So instead of increasing electricity load, not even 10%, now we're going to be increasing it more like a quarter. Um, so we're gonna be relying on the power sector here to provide a lot of the energy we're gonna be need. Um, at current, the power sector is like not quite 40% of energy demand in the United States. 
we're conceiving of a scenario where the power sector would end up being more like 75%. So we're going to be much more dependent or much more interested in what happens in the power sector as a consequence of this um, in the future compared to in the past. A comment that I made to MIT while we were doing this, um, interestingly enough, is historically, um, petroleum prices have been like a very important macroeconomic factor for the United States. And you oftentimes hear, you know, what are gas prices or so gasoline prices as a reflection of what are petroleum prices and what that means for the economy and all those kind of things. And that's definitely true. And you know, the oil shocks in the 1970s and the early 1980s were definitely big macroeconomic events for the United States. But going forward, even if you don't believe in the MIT pathway here or you want to choose a different pathway, um, power prices are becoming and will be in the future much more influential to a macro economy than they have been historically. Because in the past, power prices were basically a function of coal prices, and coal prices were very static markets. There's a small number of buyers and sellers, and they usually lock themselves into pretty long-term contracts with dependable demand and supply functions. Um, so there wasn't a lot of dynamicism in power prices because there wasn't a lot of dynamicism in coal markets. Um, for a long bit of complex reasons, I'm not going to go into right here just for um, time's sake, the power market is essentially determined or the prices in the power market are essentially determined by natural gas prices. It's not always the case, but 90% of the time in the United States, natural gas prices kind of lead directly to power prices. So natural gas prices are going to become much more important going forward um, for the macro economy than they, what they have been historically. This comes simultaneously with the rapid development of a global LNG, so liquid natural gas um, market, where previously, past decades, natural gas had essentially been a continental commodity. So the U.S. would trade with Canada and Mexico. There'd be a little bit of flow between, you know, Africa, Middle East, Europe, um, and Asia, um, and back into North and South America, but it was pretty small. Um, that volume has increased greatly and is going to continue increasing greatly which means natural gas prices, which had historically been pretty stable, are going to start behaving more like petroleum prices where they're subject to more of the dicta of a world market that can be affected by attempted monopolization and cartelization. It can be affected by geopolitical events like, you know, the Russia-Ukraine war or the Iran-Iraq war back in the day. Um, so power prices are becoming more important at the same time that what determines them, natural gas, is becoming more volatile. Um, so it's going to make energy markets uh, interesting and different from what we're kind of used to, where previously we look more at petroleum prices, and in the future we're probably going to need to look more at gas and power prices. Okay, so to keep moving on this, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that electrification means for the power sector. So I'm going to concentrate very heavily on the power sector from here on out. There are other things going on um, inside the model and inside our results here, but the power sector is where most of the major action is. So as a consequence, I want to talk through the most time on that. Um, electrification um, matters, or electrification, the, the characteristics of that are determined by really three factors, and it's the three bold um, bullet points underneath each of the colorful headers here. Um, so the electricity system, as, you, uh, as we conceive of it, is based around two concepts. One is it needs to generate a certain amount of power. So that's what we were looking on in the previous slide. So it needs to generate 47.1 quads in 2050 for us. But the power system is somewhat unique in the way that uh, it's built around its planning or its, its, its market execution. It's not built around a total amount of energy that needs to be generated. It's built around a peak amount of energy that needs to be generated. That is, imagine you're a southern state, Texas, California, or at least southern California, Florida, Georgia, something like that. And it's the hottest day of the year. You know, it's over 100. It's... Um, Everybody's running their air conditioners at absolutely full blast on a work day. So not only are homes being air conditioned very heavily, but places of work are as well. Um, that is, and it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. So the sun's pretty much at its peak. It's the hottest, you know, temperature the state or the city's going to experience all year long. 
So when you build an electricity system, you don't plan for a total amount of generation. You plan for that moment when you need as much power as possible, when you have a peak, a peak in the load, and you have to have capacity to meet that. Um, the thing is, though, planning for that is tricky um, because load can fluctuate both throughout the day, throughout the year, throughout different seasons, and then different parts of the country are going to have different load characteristics. And now increasingly um, planning for an ample or an, an adequate amount of capacity in any given hour is trickier. Um, where in the past, most of the power sector was hydro, coal, a little bit of gas, and a uh, little bit of nuclear. Those are all dispatchable um, power types where an engineer can flip a switch somewhere and a certain amount of power is gonna come out of the systems dependently. So they're very easy to kind of harness for individual or from a human standpoint in terms of what dispatch is gonna be. While a lot more wind and solar is on the system now and wind and solar are what's called intermittent. Um, wind could not blow in a given hour. Solar, you know, it could be cloudy in a given hour. Solar doesn't work at all at night for obvious reasons, unless you're in really far Northern latitudes in certain seasons. Um, so as a consequence of that, your utility planning has to look at, you know, kind of what are these different factors in terms of seasonality and the daily hourly nature of the power demand, and then also what happens in different regions. So I've left this slide up for a long time. Everybody's probably had plenty of time to read it. So I'm gonna talk through it now and say, why does this matter? Um, because the electrification kind of pathway to decarbonization is going to have some very heavily regional implications to it. There's parts of the country where this really actually won't have as much of an impact because the regions are just kind of set up to handle it relatively easily, um, given their economies and their power structures, their power sectors and the like. And there's certain parts of the country where this is going to actually be a really, 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 really big impact. And let's go through that. So residential and commercial heating very highly regional. So this is just that people running furnaces in their, you know, commercial building or their home. Um, there are some other things. So like, you know, running ovens and stuff like that. But the, the biggest part of this is heating. This is very highly regional, very strong impact in the northeast of the United States. So imagine like Virginia on north up the east coast and then in the Midwest. So imagine like the Ohio Pennsylvania border all the way to the Rocky Mountains. That like quadrant of the country where you could kind of like draw a line north of Denver and then east of Denver and everything that's in to the upper right of that quadrant um, would be very strongly affected by this. It's not that there's no impact on this in other parts of the country, but there really isn't that big of impact comparatively in terms of the heating load um, in like the Southeast or like the West Coast because they're just warmer. Seasonality, very, very highly seasonal. This has a strong impact in the winter. It has almost no impact in the summer. And then hourly, this is highly shaped as well. There's a lot more heating demand at night. Peak for heating demand tends to be like four or five in the morning when most people are asleep. But during the day, there's a limited impact. And this changes throughout the seasons. In like the shoulder months, so like spring and fall, you might have an impact at night, but not at, during the daytime at all. But then truly in the winter, you probably have a load showing up all all parts of the day because it's below freezing for everybody. Industrial processes are different though. Um, regionality is very unique. Um, it mostly kind of hits in big industrial states. So Texas, Ohio, Michigan are the examples I give though. They're, those are the first, third, and fourth biggest manufacturing states in the United States, with California being between Texas and Ohio. Um, seasonality, there really isn't much because factories and industrial facilities run all the time. Um, so there really isn't a seasonality factor to this. And there actually isn't as strong an hourly shape to this as well as people, there, there is more of an effect on this during the daytime, but a lot of factories and industrial facilities can run multiple shifts. They'll run 24 seven, maybe not quite that intensely, but they'll, they'll run more frequently. Um, so there's a muted effect where there isn't as strong of an hourly shape compared to what there would have been otherwise. EVs, um, this affects all states. Um, but EVs are less efficient in the Northeast and the Midwest compared to how they are in the South and the West. And it has to do with climate again. Um, electric vehicles, if they're being run in the cold or the very, very hot situation, um, batteries are a little less efficient when you expose them to more extreme temperatures, one. And then there's also the issue that if people are driving a car when it's below freezing or it's like above 90 degrees out there, 
they're going to be running the climate uh, control system in the cabin much more intensely. So they're running the heater or they're running the internal air conditioner, both of which makes the electric vehicle need more energy per mile than it would if it was 75 degrees out and the climate control system doesn't really have to do much. So as a consequence, um, it affects all states if you're trying to electrify the entire American vehicular fleet, but it's less efficient in certain parts of the country than in others. Seasonality, um, another fun kind of pattern here is the Bureau of Transportation Statistics actually releases monthly VMT by state. And when we analyze that data, something interesting we found is that, and it, it's intuitive, that the Northeast and the Midwestern states, the driving patterns are very highly seasonal. People drive a lot more miles in the summer and they drive a lot fewer miles in the winter. Um, but then if you go to like Arizona or Florida, there's almost no seasonality or actually slightly inverse seasonality. There's a little more driving in the winter than there is in the summer, which makes sense. Um, it sucks to drive in Minnesota in January. So people don't do it as much. Well, if you're in, again, Phoenix, it doesn't really matter because the weather's pretty comparable um, throughout the year. Yes, it's hotter in the summer, but um, it's not like it's difficult to drive in the winter like it can be challenging with Midwestern and Northeastern winters. So there's the seasonality there. And then the hourly of this is strongest at night because um, that's when cars are parked, that's when they're plugged in, that's when they're gonna be charging. Um, so just looking at this list, obviously it's gonna change region to region to region, but what this is telling us is that most of the load that's going to be coming on from electric charging or electrification overall is going to be mostly winter and it's going to be, going to be very, very heavily at night, which is going to affect about how you do utility planning in response to this. Okay, um, somebody did ask a question. Um, I will answer it real quick. Um, this is one technical pathway. Um, again, relying heavily on electrification. There are other potential ones you could imagine or design and model the impacts of, one of which would be hydrogen-based, whether that's electrolysis or some other source of the hydrogen. Um, that's not really examined here. MIT didn't want to pursue that or didn't feel that was the most viable of technical pathways for the scenario we're looking at here. Um, they wanted to lean into electrification, so that's what we did, and that's why I'm discussing it. But others, potential ways, again, hydrogen from a couple different sources, electrolysis, et cetera, et cetera, blue, green, all the different colors. Um, imagining a future where fusion technology is deployed at you know, utility scale in the next two decades is actually one of those that's just become much more viable in the last 48 hours, but it's not the one we're doing here. So um, here is a little map that shows the total amount of load. Um, there's two maps. So the top one, top left, is the total amount of load that's coming into the power sector from residential and commercial heating. It's in megawatt hours, so I converted everything from quads to megawatt hours. And we can see there that the states that are the darkest are either big states, so California and Texas are in there, or they're cold states. So Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, you know, the whole like, imagine, maybe not so Denver, but imagine like Kansas City um, into the Northwest from there. Um, you'll see that most of the states are pretty dark. Um, New York is the darkest though, which is interesting because New York has about half the population of California, but because New York is so much colder, it's gonna have a lot more heating load coming in on this compared to California, just because California is a relatively temperate state. The Northern parts are colder than the Southern parts, um, but New York, again, half the population, but more heating load because it's coldness. The graph to the lower part shows the percent impact on load compared to um, the other factors we're looking at. So this is saying in New York that 60% of the load impact is from commercial and residential heating. And here we can see kind of the same pattern I was talking about. As the states where commercial and residential heating is the biggest issue tend to be in the northeast, the you know upper right quadrant of the U.S. economy. Industrial processes, this one, like I said, is kind of kind of not screwy, but it's just every state's got kind of its own unique industrial sector, which don't have like an obviously predictable geographical pattern, like which states are warm and which states are cold. So as a consequence, we can see that Texas, Louisiana, California, and the industrial Midwestern states are the ones that show up the darkest. But in terms of percent of the impact, it's a little all over the map. Um, North Dakota, Wyoming, 
Alaska show up. Louisiana is the highest one. You can see some of the Gulf states, Texas, Iowa, Indiana, West Virginia. But interestingly enough, even though Iowa and Indiana are both high, Missouri and Illinois, you know, Illinois sandwiched in the middle, is relatively low. So industrial processes are just kind of unique. We'd have to talk about the specific states. Electric vehicles is pretty much everywhere across the country. So the top chart here, this is map is again for the load that we you know put into the power sector from this. But to be completely honest, the impact would almost be pretty proportional to population and GDP. Like if I were to regraph the top left map here and do this as a GDP map as opposed to an EV load map, it would look pretty similar. The thing is though, in the bottom map here, which states is the electric vehicles the you know biggest issue at hand? We can see that there's a very distinct geographic pattern to this. So it's California, Arizona, so the southwestern states that don't that are very warm comparatively. And then it's the southeastern states. So Missouri down into Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee into the Carolinas, and then down south from there. Um, if you're in Florida, what this is telling you is that you don't really need to worry about electrifying your heating load because you just don't have much at all. Um, it's not zero, but it's it's not the biggest of concern. Um, this problem for a Floridian or a Floridian policymaker is one about electrifying the vehicular fleet. Um, but if you're in another state that's kind of more intermediate, say like Tennessee, you can see that it's a mixture of the three. It's most strongly on the electric vehicle side, followed by the heating side. Um, but it isn't really all concentrated in one of these sectors like it would be in a state like Florida. So the other thing I wanted to show these, I just think they're pretty before we start getting into kind of what happens to the power sector and the simulations here. Um, this shows a kind of synthetic day um, and a synthetic year where you're aggregating the results for either the month or all, all hours of the year in terms of what the load effect is. So I mentioned a second ago when we look at the three different load types that we imagined, on the left, we're looking at what that load impact is by month, and on the right, we're looking at what that load impact is by hour. So we'll talk through both briefly. By month, you can see that there's a big peak in January, which rides down and then kind of flattens in the summer, June, July, August, and then creeps back up in the winter or the, the fall months into winter, and then the pattern starts again. So the reason for this, as you can probably see, is industrial processes are pretty flat throughout the year. Electric vehicles are pretty flat throughout the year, though I think people could probably see the kind of little bit of fatness in the summer months compared to in the winter months. So again, the peak summer driving season. While their residential commercial heating is extremely um, seasonal, virtually no impact in the summer, even in the furthest north of states. So like, you know, coldest states in the country are states like Montana, uh, North Dakota, um, Minnesota, and then of course, Alaska. Even then, there's really not much of a heating load in the summer months for those places. Now, the hourly shape is what I also mentioned a second ago, where this is mostly a winter issue and it's mostly a nighttime issue. Um, so industrial processes, again, not a lot of hourly shape there. Residential commercial heating, again, it peaks at like 6, 7, 8 in the morning and then tapers down during the day before increasing again. And then electric vehicles, big time charging spikes at night. So it just like start at midnight. Over the rest of the night, um, electric vehicle charging is decreasing and then people kind of, you know, get up, get in the car, go to work, go and park the car away from a charging station. So the load of electric vehicle charging in the morning is pretty low. You can see there's a little bump in the middle of the day. So occasionally people will plug in a parked vehicle during the day. And then there's a big drop again at not, in the evening when people are out and about again. And then there's a big spike in that late evening and um, up till about 10 o'clock or so as a consequence of that. So if you're doing this from a utility planning standpoint, you need to make sure you have adequate power to do everything that's needed, um, mostly in the night, mostly in the winter. Um, this is interesting because it means that different power types are slightly um, more or less viable or more or less useful to this. And I'll just use wind and solar as the big instance here because that's the big one that we'll talk about in a second. Um, solar is easy to conceive of when solar is most useful. Uh, solar is not useful at all at night. Obviously it's dark out, no sun, no solar power. But solar is pretty useful during the day, um, You know, at least when it's not a cloudy or dim day, all things considered. Um, so solar is gonna help 
kind of inversely to when this energy is needed if you look at it. Um, so solar's good in the summer, but that's not really when we need a lot of the load. And it's good during the day, which is also not really where we need a lot of this. While wind is kind of the opposite. Wind is better when it's cold out. Evidently, the atmosphere is more turbulent when it's colder. Um, so there's more wind as a consequence of that. And also colder air is denser. So you're more able to harvest energy from that. Um, and then same thing, um, not just our, both seasonally and hourly. Wind is stronger at night for the reasons I just mentioned. It's also stronger in the winter for the reasons that I just mentioned. So if you're trying to match up these shapes with what kind of available renewable energy there is, given the technologies that we have at the moment, wind graphs over it very, very well. Not perfectly so, but very well, while solar is unfortunately just not perfectly well set up to deal with this incremental load. It's better at dealing with the existing load, which is much more based around air conditioning. So the better solar is, the more air conditioning load there tends to be. But we're looking at the incremental from electrification for which wind is, in most cases, better tailored. I'm going to skip these next couple slides. Um, these slides are going to be available um, if anybody wants them. You know, Mr. Judson will, you know, distribute them if somebody wants, and I'll have my email up before the end. But uh, I went through and I looked at the individual load shapes for a couple different states, but again, we kind of already talked through the logic of what exactly that would look like. So let's talk about what we actually discovered in the power sector. So this is a map here of the power markets of the United States, uh, continentally, including um, uh, parts of Canada and parts of Mexico, because they are linked into each other, and they're going to be linked stronger into each other in the future than they are right now. Um, for those of you who haven't really been exposed to kind of how wholesale power markets, so wholesale markets are where the generation actually takes place as opposed to retail markets where that power is delivered to individual customers, you know, you and I on any given day. Um, this is what the map of the system looks like. And it's kind of a random kind of smattering of lines across and kind of within and then sometimes between states. Um, the power system in the United States was kind of set up hodgepodgely in the early 20th century between competing interests that didn't necessarily deploy technologies that were compatible with each other. And we're kind of stuck in the legacy of that. Um, so if you not, haven't seen this map before, it might be looking, it might be worth looking up like an ISO map or a power system map or something like that, just to kind of familiarize yourself with the geography. Because what this means is that different parts of the country's power systems are going to interact with each other much more strongly even though they might not be closely connected to each other geographically because of the layout of this map so i'll just quickly give us a tour here um, new england has its own system it is connected to other places but iso new england you know has a fair level of independence and in operation new york has its own system the Mid-Atlantic and the Eastern Midwest is dominated by a system called PJM, which has a bunch of different subregions in it. Um, Chicago is linked in with PJM. Um, so ironically, you know, Chicago is geographically much closer to St. Louis or Des Moines or Minneapolis or Milwaukee than it is to the East Coast cities like Philly or Baltimore or D.C. or Pittsburgh. Um, but Chicago's power system is linked in with those eastern cities and not those midwestern cities that are kind of surrounding it as the you know end of the spokes on the hub. Um, so you know the conversation about you know what do you do if you're trying to do this as Illinois? Well, you have to deal with what PJM's doing and what the states to your east are doing, not so much just what's going on inside the Midwest for the rest of Illinois. While downstate, the issue is in a system called MISO, Midcontinent Inter. Inter independent system operator, um, where that stretches from the Gulf Coast, Louisiana and Eastern Texas and parts of Mississippi up the Mississippi Valley and then into, you know, not a random, but kind of a Y-shaped uh, collection of Midwestern states there minus Chicago. SPP, uh, Southwest Power Pool, is mostly the um, kind of high plain states out to the Rockies. There's a system called WEC, which is the western part of the country, which is dominated by KISO, so California, but it has its own kind of independent systems there. Um, and these link into, you know, Mexico and Canada as well. So this geography is going to influence the results that we have. Okay, so real quick, I thought I'd show everybody what happens to the power system when we're doing this modeling in this technological pathway. Um, so on the left, we have the AEO reference scenario of what's being generated in different regions. And the reason I want to show this to you is there's really not a lot of like 
changing in the proportion between the different power types or different regions, excuse me. Um, the orange one on top, I gave it like a nice longhorn orange for ERCOT, which is Texas, um, or at least the more populous parts of Texas. So Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, um, Austin are all in there. Um, that is growing pretty rapidly, but it's not night and day different than anywhere else. Well, on the MIT pathway, you get a big spike in ERCOT, which again is Texas. You also get a big spike in the green one, which is MISO. So that's like Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, down the Mississippi Valley that we showed on the map a second ago. And you also get a pretty big increase in the purple one, which is SPP. And I kind of hinted at this a little, you know, a bit a moment ago, but I think you all can probably intuitively understand is what's going on inside of this. Um, different parts of the country have different resource endowments. So I talked about the energy demand side of electrification, you know, for 15 minutes there. And I showed you the little maps and the kind of shapes of what the load would look like. But now I'm talking about what the supply side effect would be for the electricity sector as a consequence of this. Um, so on the left is the AEO reference case. So let's go through each of these colors quickly. Um, I know they're kind of bright and kind of Miami Vice, but uh, I thought it would be easy to visualize for everybody if you can see these bright contrasting colors. On the left, we see that um, gas, which is the light blue color in the middle, is staying a large part of the power mixture and it's actually slightly increasing in the future. Black on top is coal, is decreasing over time. So we're showing the slow attrition of the remaining coal fleet. It isn't completely gone by 2050, but a lot of it is. What's coming up to replace the coal and to generate the additional um, load that's coming onto the system are the colors on the bottom, um, which are solar and wind. So you can see that wind is increasing very rapidly to 2025, which is when a subsidy called the wind power tax credit expires. So at that point, wind economics become much worse. And as a consequence, you get more solar. Um, pink, kind of in the middle there, I should have talked about it a second ago, is the nuclear. Um, we modeled nuclear to where the existing fleet is going to slowly kind of age out over the next 30 years. Um, most nuclear plants have a light have a license from the Nuclear Energy Regulatory Commission that they need to operate, and most of those licenses, as of now, expire in the next 30 years. Theoretically, though, you could extend those out. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a pro forma process, um, but you could, in theory, keep the existing nuclear fleet lasting longer. And that's kind of what we do on the right. So on the right, what we do is the coal fleet becomes uncompetitive under the carbon tax in 2025. So it's retired out fairly quickly. There is still some gas around even until the end. Um, so gas is a nice resource because it's dispatchable and it's relatively cheap. The nuclear fleet, instead of it fading out, we say that the existing plants can extend their lifespan indefinitely. Um, so they're there in 2050 to generate power. There is some additional solar compared to what we thought, but the real, 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 real big winner here, or the real big kind of bedrock of this would be wind. And it's because of that load shape thing I talked about. Wind is better at night and it's better in the winter, which is exactly when we need to juice. Um, so I'm going to skip that real quickly and kind of go into, or excuse me, I don't have that. Um, I don't have the energy resources map in here. Um, that also kind of takes me back to the other point that I made here a second ago about where in the country this is going to be a big issue. Um, the regions that I just showed you a second ago, so let's go back to this here, um, that had the big spikes were SPP, so that kind of gold yellow one in the middle, so Dakota's down into Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle. MISO, which again is Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan Panhandle, most of Iowa, lots of Missouri, Arkansas, um, Eastern Texas and Louisiana and Western Mississippi. And the last one that had the most significant impact there was ERCOT. So ERCOT is again, is the bulky, you know, the bulk of Texas's economy and population. So again, Houston's there, Dallas there, Austin, San Antonio, and most of the medium size, which are actually large size cities because it's Texas surrounding them. Um, the reason that you get so much more generation in those regions is because that's where the wind resources are. Um, we all probably, you know, understand this intuitively, but 
renewable energy is not evenly distributed throughout the continent or the world for that matter. The best wind resources like in the world are basically in the MISO SPP footprint and down into ERCOT. So imagine those high flat plains of like Western Nebraska or Western Texas and Northern or Northwestern Minnesota and the like. Um, a lot of wind to be generated there. So that's a lot of the generation takes place. This does present one interesting problem though. Um, there are wind resources in other places, say like offshore New England. So like, say like Hampton Roads, Virginia, all the way up, you know, past Cape Cod, past Maine, up through Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. So there's a lot of good wind resources off the east coast of the United States. Um, the west coast doesn't have as good of wind resources. There's some decent stuff around the California, Oregon border, but any further north or south of there, and it degrades in quality pretty quickly. And the Gulf Coast, um, the Gulf of Mexico doesn't really have much for wind resources. It's not zero, but it's not nearly as attractive as it is on the east, um, which means you're going to have a lot of power generation in parts of the country that don't necessarily have all that much demand increasing. So we're going to have to find a way to get all the power from SPP and MISO eastward into PJM and eastward into New York. So we don't really study this in our report that we did. Um, it's something that we've talked about as potential follow on because I think it would be very important is what are the transmission impacts of all this? So we didn't model really any trans any long haul transmission expansions between like, say, like Omaha and Philadelphia. Um, but in reality, something like that is something that would need to be more carefully studied and examined if you're going to be doing something like this, where you greatly increase the amount of power generated because you're de decarbonizing through electrification and you're doing it based on a power type, again, wind, that silver color at the bottom here, that's mostly located in one region of the country, or not one region, but particular regions in the center part of the country. Um, the east can be supplemented by the offshore wind, but it's going to need help from other places. You also would maybe potentially need some power from Canada in this case. Um, there's a lot of untapped hydro potential in like Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec, um, which could theoretically be shipped down into New England and into the Northeast of the United States. So there'd be a lot of kind of transmission that needs to be studied here. We didn't look at it specifically. We did look at how much kind of the transmission system was strained when you did this. And it's what I kind of said. The biggest strain was between MISO and PJM and between um, PJM and up into New York. So moving the power in specific places um, was, was causing the transmission system to kind of flex there. Um, but with that, um, those are the major factors we need to worry about with this. We modeled this through Remy, um, but unfortunately we're kind of running out of time here, I think, and I want to leave at least some room for questions at the end. So as a consequence, I think I'm going to pause and see if, uh, Chris and uh, Brian have any to add to this and I'll put my contact information up real quick. Um, so that's me, hi. Um, if anybody wants these slides, feel free to let me know or has specific questions that I either don't get to or you just don't want to address in this medium, that's fine as well. But otherwise, thank you everyone for paying attention. That's our pathway. And if you want to see the full paper that discusses a little bit more about the methodology we use to build everything into Remy and what the actual findings were, then let me know and I'm happy to link you to it. So, Chris, how are we doing? Um, great. Thank you, Scott. Fantastic presentation. We, we have a lot of good questions here. Um, we'll, we'll try to lob for 10, maybe 15 minutes here to answer questions. So, if folks do have some additional questions, uh, please get them in. Um, but firstly, uh, how realistic is a 50% uh, uh, battery reduction in 2050? What about uh, just simple escalation in addition? So the way that's developed, again, I'm not an engineer or scientist whatsoever, is the folks we are working with at MIT went to the technical specialists, again, the people who actually do this type of engineering at MIT, one of the you know, finest education institutions on the planet, and asked them, what is the ragged edge of potentially possible? If we're going to go for the, you know, this is what we think could be done. That's not a prediction. It's not going to be absolutely perfect. Nothing like that ever is. But if we get as far forward at this technology as we think we can in the next few decades, roughly what would it cost and what would its capabilities be? So we built it around what the you know experts at MIT thought was, again, at the far reaches of possible because we were going for the ambition of trying to completely re eliminate um, 
carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so we wanted to see, again, what that would cost, what that would look like in terms of its impact if a, you know, rapid development scenario of certain technologies comes about. So that's where the decrease in battery costs and the decrease in the wind and solar costs came from. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's a good follow-up question. What's the rationale for applying an 8% real annual increase in the carbon tax rate over the analysis period? Sure. So that's another MIT assumption, but the main reason there is that this provides an incentive to decarbonize the power sector, so to change the power mixture away from things like gas and coal as we have it now. So again, on the left, you can see the black and the light blue color are pretty dominant all the way out to 2050, while on the right, um, coal is gone, um, at least at the utility generation scales, and natural gas is still present. You still need it as kind of a peak load and for ancillary services, but you're not using it as kind of one of your core generating technologies anymore, like you are wind and solar. This, by the way, does include batteries. So there would be battery storage where, for instance, in the summer, you might have wind charging up batteries at night and then deploying them when air conditioning is running in the during the daytime. Um, so batteries are there. It's just not batteries are not a type of generation. They just move generation around between hours and days. So they, they don't show up in here as a type. Um, so the main reason um, for that was one is to influence the power sector to help decarbonize. The other reason was kind of the first thing we went through, which is um, the total energy demand. If fossil energy is more expensive, it's going to incentivize both efficiency, one, and then two, also electrification, because now you're going to face a choice between buying a fossil product that's expensive because of the carbon tax comparatively comparing it against the relative price of an electricity product that provides the same energy service, but is fairly cheap because there's not a lot of carbon emissions from the power sector, as I just showed if you in the last slide. Um, so as a consequence, it, it changes the economics between, again, clean and green as opposed to fossil-based energy service. Um, and over time, that gets more the the shapes and the path that you're seeing here um, as a result. Thank you. Um, what trends do you see justifying a 25% uh, reduction in energy demand? Is, is this just in the U.S. or world? This is only U.S. Um, we didn't try to model or even really look at what the implications of all these kind of technologies would be globally. Because that would be interesting, because if these technologies are deployable in the U.S., whether it's cars or electric heat pumps or types power plants there's theoretically no reason they couldn't be deployed globally relatively rapidly after that it wouldn't be overnight um, but usually you know if it it works at a utility scale in the united states it'll it'll start making its way around other places if it's a better option than what's out there so we didn't look at what these global implications of all this would be and we didn't try to come up with a net zero global we're just looking at the u.s here um, in terms of the, the impacts that we're getting out of this Oh, and then the realism of that. Okay, um, so back to the energy efficiency assumption. Sorry, I answered the second part of the question first. That was another MIT thing where they asked, again, they're experts on energy efficiency, and we asked them the same question. What is the ragged edge of possible from what you know where people will still be served with the same energy, but you know it'll be delivered in a more efficient manner? And that's what they gave us is roughly a 25%. Again, it's a round number, it's an impressionistic idea. We're going for an ambition here of completely decarbonizing. We're not um, necessarily trying to hit on everything because nobody really knows exactly what that's going to be 30 years from now, but we wanted to get as reasonable a guess from the best experts that we could. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, let's see, what about air transport, vessel transport, train transport? What assumptions are used? Does it matter? Um, so we actually didn't affect those very much, like at all. Um, we did increase their efficiency in the same way, like the 25%. So marine, air transport, and uh, rail, yeah, those are all part of the emission system, or all part of the transportation system, and they all have emissions associated with their operations, but <laughs> it's relatively small compared to the vehicular fleet, so the surface transportation fleet, cars, trucks. Um, so we did 
add the energy efficiency there, but they are still emitting by 2050. Um, there were there was some discussion we might do something a little more ambitious and say look at like some sort of advanced biofuel or some sort of CNG LNG um, transport for marine or something like that. Um, we didn't really have time or scope to do it though, so deeper dives on those sectors could be possible, and I think it would be interesting both from a modeling like macro standpoint, like you're seeing here. And then also from a technical standpoint, from like the engineering perspective, but those sectors were not de dealt with in detail the same way that we did the, the surface transportation fleet, just because they're not really as big a part of the issue compared to, again, cars and trucks. So we, we went for the big stuff and tried to nail that. And we left some of the smaller stuff on the side just for the sake of kind of, you know, getting this done and making sure that it wasn't too laden with assumptions and research. Um, we're trying to go for a big goal with some big changes that I think are hopefully relatively straightforward and understandable. Thank you. These next two questions, I, I think you explained this uh, later on in the presentation in, in terms of scope. But uh, firstly, uh, do alternative fuels uh, come into the picture? For example, ammonia-based fuels, green biofuel, <laughs> And, and secondly, uh, how is the net zero achieved? I'm not familiar with these acronyms, but DAC and BECCS. Sure. Um, so the way net zero is eventually achieved, I'll just do that question first, is I mentioned at the outset that there would still be some emissions from the power sector. So you can see here that there's a little bit of emissions left from gas. Not a lot, but there would be a bit of emissions left from gas. And there still would be emissions from um, the industrial sector where electrification isn't technically feasible and then also from the transportation sector mostly with long-haul trucking and then the other kind of larger vehicles ships aircraft that we talked about a moment ago um, for those what we did was we did a combination of land use changes so that was another kind of question we put to MIT where if you have the most aggressive kind of effort towards carbon sequestration and capture that you can through land use changes, mostly in the agricultural sector. And you also, in the later years, introduced direct air capture technology. So this would be industrial scale, utility scale carbon scrubbers that remove carbon dioxide from the air and either metabolize it to oxygen or capture and store it underground where it's no longer affecting the world climate system. Um, so that's DAC, DAC, direct air capture. So those technologies start coming online um, in the later years. For context right now, U.S. emissions are about 5,000 million metric tons, a little less than that, but roughly that. By the time we got to the end of this, the emissions that were happening in our model were about 500. So we're reducing emissions about 90% from where they are now. And we're using either, again, net reductions from land use and agriculture or direct air capture to scrub the less rest of that out. And that gets you to a net zero by 2050. And again, we're doing this through an elect electricity-based and electrification-based technological pathway. Theoretically, there would be others though. Again, hydrogen could be one. The deployment of fusion this century could be one. There's a couple different ones you could follow. This one with you know the client MIT's choice, we decided to lean very heavily into electrification. Thank you. Um, are there any assumptions made uh, for new battery production? Uh, was that a part of the scope? Are there any concerns or considerations for the uh, available supply of, of batteries? Um, the MIT folks basically told us is that the lithium is there. Um, obviously, the, the industry would need to be set up over the next two decades to provide all the batteries that would be necessary to go mostly into the transportation fleet. Um, there are utility scale batteries, so you know, power generation related batteries being deployed in what we're doing here, but that's a pretty small slice of the pie compared to the transportation fleet. Um, so they said that the resource is there to do something like this. It's just the industry has to develop, um, but you know, it's developed a lot even in the last 10 years. And if you believe most major auto manufacturers, they are going to have very heavily, if not exclusively electric vehicle um, fleets or sales lines by the 2030s. Um, 
So it, it's coming. It's happening. They said it is possible. It's obviously a gargantuan effort. It's comparable to the setting up of the steel industry or the chemical sector that happened early in the industrial revolution in the 19th century. But if we're going to do a transition like this, there's going to be have be a lot of big things going on, a lot of big changes being made. So they didn't think that was really the issue. Um, so yeah, they, they felt it was in the realm of the technically possible, assuming again, an industry like that can develop over the next 20 years, which they think it can. Thank you. Well, we are a bit over time. I think we have time for one last question. There are several other questions and you know, we encourage everyone to you know, please reach out to us for a detailed conversation. Um, in regards to, to electric uh, RC cooling, uh, were there any projections on uh, load shapes over time? And further to that point, you know, were there any further considerations in uh, changes in uh, energy efficiency of these various technologies over time, or did you assume like a step Sure. It depends on the technology. Um, normally speaking, what we do is we rely on um, whatever the AEO reference forecast is to account for what the underlying efficiency or improvements are. Because the AEO reference forecast is not static. Um, there are increases in efficiency going on over time and the like. Um, so there is some of that. We just accelerated certain ones of that, the most important of which being electric vehicles um, and then wind, solar, and batteries uh, for utilities. Um, the thing though is, and one other thing I wanted to note too, um, while we're kind of on the topic of batteries here, um, we conservatively assume there wouldn't be very much load shape management or load shaping through um, the batteries, uh, through batteries. So theoretically, which just like talk through one little example here. Let's say it's like the middle of the day um, in Florida and it's really, really hot. Um, you could theoretically draw power off of electric vehicles if they're parked and plugged in. Um, so that way you wouldn't have to say turn on a gas plant. And then that night when, you know, it's not hot out anymore and people aren't running the air conditioners as much, maybe you could refill those electric batteries using excess wind generation. Um, Florida is obviously not going to have great wind resources compared to most states, but if the transmission system's robust enough, maybe you could bring some in from the rest of the continent, or maybe you could bring some down offshore from like the Carolinas or something like that. Um, there's nothing like that modeled in here because we want to be conservative. Um, you could imagine a future though where load shaping is much more extensive than it is right now, where it's pretty primitive compared to what you theoretically could imagine. So we didn't really go very high into the, the load shaping conversation here. We want to, in this case, say, you know, we, we need to have enough power um, and we need to have enough capacity, even if, um, and assume that any load shaping is just the benefit that makes it easier from there, as opposed to now where we have to deal with the system without much of that. Okay, well, makes sense. Um, certainly an exciting analysis. Um, Scott, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for, for joining us uh, today. Scott, do you have any final words? Um, no, thank you for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. I will note that, you know, this presentation just touches on the top of an iceberg. There's a lot more to look at, both in terms of what the impacts are inside of a model like Remy, and then also down the, you know, individual assumptions and research that led to those technical assumptions and pathways that we talked about. So if anybody has questions about that, my contact information is back up again. Remy's going to send out these slides. And if anybody wants to see the actual full MIT report, which is like a couple hundred pages long, um, I can happy to provide that link to everybody as well. Great. Thank you, Scott. Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, have a, a fantastic afternoon. And uh, everyone should, within a few hours, there'll be a copy of the presentation available on the website. And everyone uh, within a few business days will we'll receive an email with a link and uh, a link to uh, the, the full report. Um, thank you all and have a great evening.